So good morning. Uh, first of all, uh, my name is Marta Garcia Maruri. I'm Deputy Director for Communication at the Bilbao Fine Arts Museum. And first of all, I would like to thank Deusto University for having invited the Bilbao Fine Arts Museum, which I represent, to be part of the CONNECT project. <laughs> I would also like to express my gratitude to all European students attending this talk with the hope that it will be useful and that the experience of our museum, which I will be showing you in the next hour, more or less, contributes to that purpose. Before starting, I would like to tell you that this talk comes directly from the museums and, of course, from my own experience. So let's start at the beginning. And the beginning is 1908 in this old picture that I am showing in the first time, which shows the School of Arts and Crafts. In this date, 1908, in the turn of the century, was the foundation of the Bilbao Fine Arts Museum. It's a moment in which the city of Bilbao lives a very special period because it's a very wealthy city due to the iron mines, due to the strategic port, and both things make possible an industry, a shipping industry, an iron industry, and together with it, the, um, the nascence of a burgeoning working at the time in the city. This burgeoning thought that this wealthiness had to go parallel with a cultural renaissance in the city. So we have here a first stakeholder of the museum, the citizens. But at the time, there were also a very important group of artists working here in Bilbao and also traveling to Paris to know the avant-garde news that were happening in the arts there and then bringing them back to Bilbao and to the Spanish painting as well. So this is the second stakeholder, the artists. At the end, the institutions. At the time, there was a very important Bilbao City Council and also the Provincial Council and putting together these three stakeholders, they made possible to have a museum. In the beginning, the museum was just three rooms in that old building that I have shown you before, that was the School of Arts and Crafts. And there were just three rooms with um, a former museography that I'm showing you. And please keep this picture in mind because we are going to see it later in nowadays how we use all museographies in an updated way. You can see here this museography that puts together different artists, styles, chronology, paintings of different um, schools as well. But from the beginning, some paintings that even nowadays are among our masterpieces. Also, this first collection um, made some nucleus that um, represent the way of growing the collection. This uh, uh, painting by Martin de Bosch, the Flemish painting, The Rape of Europe, is now one of the masterpieces of the collection, but also is one of the nucleus of the collection, the Flemish painting. You can see the painting uh, nowadays. Um, here, please note how it entered the collection. Donated. It was donated by Horacio Echevarrieta. Horacio Echevarrieta, that was a very important businessman. One of those uh, people, those um, businessmen belonging to the Basque uh, burgeoning that strongly believe that a museum was very important for education and for the cultural development of the city. Also from the beginning, you can see another old picture in the 20s with the museum's director guiding school visit. This man here is first director, Manuel Lozada, that we are going to see later on as well. This is a school visit. And also one of the masterpieces of the collection, another painting by Orazio Gentileschi, the Italian 
painting painter sorry that was acquired so together with donations the institutions also bought uh, important pieces of art such as this one to make the collection uh, bigger and of bigger quality as well and talking about the director this is Manuel Lozada the man that I have uh, shown before the painter Manuel Lozada, which is in the 19th century, is a, is a model of director, not like some directors now, nowadays, more uh, businessmen, some of them, but in this case, a connoisseur, uh, someone who directly knows art, that directly knows artists, like this is the case, Manuel Lozada, a very well-known and important painter in Basque painting. You can see here, another important painting that I show you, which is by Jan Madin, the Burlesque, Burlesque Feast. And it was bequeathed by Laureano de Jado, another businessman in the city that decided in 1927 to give all his collection for this uh, ancient museum. And if you want to know him, here you have Mr. Laureano de Jado, with this funny hat, really, really nice man. And an old practice that also nowadays you can see in many museums in Europe and even in America, that is naming the room with the paintings that he gave, Sala Jado. So it's a way of, you know, saying thank you uh, to this man and to make public this uh, important gesture. Other people, like José Palacio, made the donation of other collections. José Palacio was a collector here in Bilbao that used to travel to the auctions in Paris and was very keen on Oriental art. And that's the way, um, that's the reason we have an important collection of more than 400 objects of Oriental art in our collection, something that is really unusual in a city like ours. But is the origins that uh, say what we are today. So that's the reason why we have this unusual, uh, unique collection. In the collection Oriental Art, but another important printings like this Rembrandt, and also is uh, um, another of the reasons why we have an important uh, representation of uh, works on paper in the collection. But we have been traveling uh, to Paris, to Belgium, as we have said before, our artists like Dario de Regoyos and many others travel outside to know the avant-garde movements. And Dario de Regoyos is the first uh, impressionist painting in a Spanish uh, painting, the first impressionist painter, I'm sorry. And you see another way of getting paintings into the collection. This was a contribution by the Bilbao, City Council. Another important Basque artist is Adolfo Guiard, also traveling to Paris. And this painting, which is another masterpiece of the collection, is, uh, was contributed by the Provincial Council of Vizcaya. Another way of getting the collection bigger is the public subscription. It was this painting by the Basque painter uh, Benito Barrueta was also bought by public subscription in 1918. So you see how citizens also contribute to their museum. We will see a, an updated way of, of this formula later. Next year, sorry, in 1919, there was an important exhibition celebrated in Bilbao. It was promoted by the artist. I have told you before that the artist was a very important stakeholder. And they promote this international exhibition of painting and sculpture. You have here an old picture of the artist uh, about to celebrate a lunch to celebrate as well the opening of the exhibition. A very important exhibition for Bilbao and even for Spain because on that exhibition there were some uh, paintings acquires such important, such as this one, this Mary Cassatt 
that till now is the only painting by this impressionist American woman in any Spanish collection. Or this painting by Paul Gauguin that till the Thyssen uh, Museum came to Madrid was also the only Gauguin in a public collection in Spain. So you can see how important was this exhibition. All the paintings by Ignacio Zuluaga were donated and bought in the same year. They were donated by Ramón de la Sota, a very important businessman having a business on shipbuilding, very, very outstanding, and donate this uh, painting by Ignacio Zuluaga, the most, one of the most important painters in the turn of the century in the Spanish painting. Also paintings by El Greco, this masterpiece by Rivera, you see that these are acquisitions. This is, um, this is another nucleus, the Spanish school. Or Jean Gossard, the Renaissance in the North. Again, this, the Spanish school, like Francisco de Zurbarán. But before these paintings, there was another important date. In 1924, there was the opening of another museum, the Museum of Modern Art in Bilbao. That was um, the first director was also a painter, in this case, Aurelio Arteta. And let me read you a critic uh, at the time. Our museum should be an antenna that is sensitive to all messages, no matter how distant and strange they may seem. Its job as a sentinel will require it to run all the risks, even of being wrong. These words are important because uh, they mean another of the characteristics of this museum, which is being always looking around, looking to contemporary, looking to what is happening around the museum. We were talking about Aurelio Arteta, first director, and here we have another highlight of the collection, this painting also donated by Begonia de la Sota of that family that we have talked before. But in 1936, there was the Spanish Civil War. All the works of the museum had to be evacuated and traveled by ship to France. Here you see an old uh, picture here with all the frames, all the pictures had to be unframed to travel, and all the frames were deposited in a store, all the pictures and sculptures of the museum, but together with it, some um, paintings of private collections. Please keep in mind these three Goyas that went to France on that time to avoid the destructions and the disasters of war. We will see them later as well. After the war, in 1945, the collections came back to the city and it was decided to unificate both collections, the old Fine Arts Museum collection and the Modern Art collection in one, and also to build up a new, a completely new building for them. The, the building is this that you can see even nowadays, and it's a building in a neoclassical style, very much based on what, on what uh, Villanueva did in El Prado Museum in Madrid. Soon it was also too small, so in the 70s, there was this first extension, in this case, following models of the modern international movement. So you see till now how our history is a history of continuously growing and adapting to the times. Meanwhile, we kept on buying important works of art. This by Francisco de Goya, also bequeathed by Ramón de la Sota, you remember again this family, or Luis de Morales. I have talked to you about the Spanish painting nucleus as one of the most important in the collection, but the contemporary, we have talked before, how the contemporary art is being always a concern for the museum. And that's the reason we have pieces like this wonderful Francis Bacon, 
or Anthony Tapius, born in 1985, and at the same time, keeping with the old Spanish school paintings like this wonderful Bartolomé Esteban Murillo with a new formula. There was a Dacian, which is uh, paying uh, a certain amount of taxes instead of, you know, the whole amount in money. And it was uh, bought in this way in the year 2000. And please keep in mind also this painting. Also, Miquel Barceló, one of the most international contemporary artists. And of course, Eduardo Chillida, which is now the most in, uh, international Basque sculptor. Or the Renaissance in the North that we have talked before with this uh, acquisition of Lucas Cranach the Elder in 2012. And the latest donations just last year, this wonderful piece entitled Bilbao by Richard Serra, the American sculptor Richard Serra, or this Juan Muñoz that has been donated just a couple of months ago. So to finish with, with this really fast way that I have, un, I have done through the history and the collection, one thought, the history and the collection support the reputation of our museum. A collection that extends from the 13th to the 20th century with significant schools and artists in Western art, as we have seen before, with the most important of Basque art and with unique collections, like the collection of Oriental art that I have shown you before. The collection holds together 14,000 work of art, about 2,000 paintings, 500 sculptures, 10,000 works of art on paper, excuse me, and 1,000 applied arts. So we arrived to the 90s with some strengths, but some weaknesses. Let's see the strengths we have seen so far. History, collection, and the institutional plus civic plus artistic initiative. But the weaknesses, a governing structure, the facilities, the budget, poor recognition, and outside of the metropolitan renewal. Why? Because in 1997, we see the opening, we saw the opening of the Guggenheim Bilbao Museum, a completely new museum in the city. Uh, with a completely different aim to renew all the um, city. Um, a case of success, which is a study at the Guggenheim effect, and based on an architectural icon to be recognizable as, um, as the main modernization of the city. So our museum um decide to do something and this is the answer the museum plan 2000 in which the first part was to renovate the premises starting with all the visitor services i put here some images of new spaces like this auditorium that we made the stores many places um, in the in the museum to try to adapt to these new times. But the most important thing was to make the Bilbao Fine Arts Museum Foundation and the Board of Trustees. In it, uh, we met together the founders, we have talked before, the Bilbao City Council, the Provincial Council of Bilbao, of Pizcaya, excuse me, and later the Basque government, and some trustees that help us with different programs in the museum. So they not only give money, they not only um, act in the governing body of the museum, but the main different point is that each of them support a different activity program in the museum, as we are going to see later on. This is the actual map of the corporate member program with three founder trustees, one trustee of honor, one strategic trustee, 
10 trustees, 6 collaborating companies, 23 different companies, which make a total of 44 institutions and companies helping us daily uh, with all the activities in the museum. And another important thing we made on that time was to establish for the very first time the mission of the museum and to the traditional museums of the museum gather, conserve, study and disseminate the collection. I underline uh, new things like maintain services, promote quality activities with the goal of actively contributing to education society, that education aim that we have seen from the beginning, but here much more direct to the audience, talking about services and activities. So let's have a look to education, which is one of these, you know, uh, purposes of the museum from the very beginning. Here I put... Um, the education department in the 80s. You see this uh, style, this is cool style with a desk. And on the other uh, picture in 2001, 20 a, a model more based on creation. And nowadays, much more based on co-creation is the model of workshops and how the uh, age range of the activity of the department comes from zero, from babies, to the elders. There are program, programs for kids 0 to 12 years, of course for young people from 13 to 16, and of course of more than 60 years. I have chosen these two pictures because I think it's funny to see uh, just how they sit. You know, the young people sitting on the floor and the elders sitting in a more comfortable way. And I have put also a new concept in education, edutainment, which is education and entertainment. In this uh, activity for older than 60 years, there's a visit that they made through the gallery with an educator. And then they go together to have a coffee and talk about what they have fe felt or what they have thought during the visit. So new format, a new way of attending the um, expectations of the audience. And what is called the new no audience, people that usually some years ago didn't come to the museum. Now we want them to come. So we make a special programs for social insertion. Here you have uh, a very uh, important one, a pioneering program called Touching the Art for um, people with um, disability in um, visual disabilities. And we made this program in 2012 here in-house. Then there's a program that some museums are using uh, nowadays, such as El Prado Museum, or a Thyssen Museum in Madrid, but also some museums in Russia, for instance, following our model. In 2012, we did it in-house. You see, there are some reproductions, tactile reproductions of some important paintings in the collection. But last year and this year, we made the program Turin in our province, and this year is Turin in uh, the next province, in the province of San Sebastian, in Gipuzkoa, in many high schools. So they can experience, all the, the, the students can experience the ones with visual difficulties and also to sensitive the ones that have not this problem. So it's a very, very important program in this, in this uh, way. Also not... Uh, for students, but also for the teachers. Some kind of two months ago, we have celebrated here a teacher's training on art therapy. Another professional trainings, we have a conservation and restoration scholarship for people who want to work in our conservation and uh, restoration department. I have put here the sponsor 
the trustee that is helping us with this program. Or another one helping us, Fundación Gondra Barandiaran, you see here the label, which help us with this professional training. Each year we have seven students, seven people that have finished their studies, um, working in different departments, professional departments, in our museum. The Fundación Gondra Barandiaran also help us with another program, in this case, academic, more for experts, which is the summer course. And it's a program in which we study things that uh, belongs to our job. In this case, museography, that was last year. And this year, I have put a picture with uh, Juan Ignacio Bidarte, which is the general director of the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. But... Searching for new audiences, young people, this is a difficult issue for us, a very difficult. If you see the age of ranges, uh, it's quite clear that it's bigger the range of people over 60 years than the people between 13, 19 and 30, I think. I don't read very well this, I'm sorry. Think and 30, I think. 19 and 30 years old. So you see how, you know, this is our main public. So this would be a public that we would like uh, to attract or at least not to scare. So we are making some efforts, free entrance for younger than 25, but this is not enough if we don't make at the same time activities that may interest them. For instance, cinema, classic cinema. We have made an agreement a couple of years ago with the Basque Film Archive in San Sebastian to have their um, cinema program here weekly. So every weekend we have here a program of um, classical cinema and is also free for younger than 25 but also different activities. We had an exhibition called After 68 that we will see later on, but there was a special part of the exhibition devoted to music and was a part of the exhibition that the young people visit a lot. At the same time, we made a different workshop for them, a workshop for phonography that was attended mainly for uh, young people, I must say. Another agreements in 2019, so this year, we made a collaboration with NFNAC to have here some showcases, acoustic concerts, to present new uh, works of important singers in Spain. I must say we did this a month ago and this auditorium was completely filled up. So it was a very successful activity but also introducing new languages such as video art, digital art and creations program support by BBVA, which is also a way to try to engage with the young people. Or performance. We had here in 2016 the most important Spanish performer, which is Esther Ferrer, and in last year, we, with one of his um, students, we repeat, repeat one of uh, the most, her most celebrated uh, performance. Other languages as performing arts. We had in this exhibition, after 68, a performing art with Kukai Danza, which is a very important dancing group in the Basque country as well. Friends of the Museum the best prescribers for us. We have nearly 4,000 uh, friends of the museum that help with the participation. They come to openings, courses, lectures, guide tours, and even design their activities. We have this beautiful uh, activity, Choose Your Favorite Work, in which they choose, chose between the masterpieces of the collections, the ones that they wanted to be, to have uh, one of our curators, 
explaining them. You see here how our creator, Javi Novo, is explaining that this picture by the Basque painter Eduardo Zamacois. And just a curious thing. You see here the painting again and how it inspired the costume of the baritone Leon Nucci singing in the Bilbao Opera House in 2013. So small ideas as well are useless, are useful, sorry, are useful to engage different publics. Of course, in the book, in the handbook of the opera, this was the painting. So anyone attending the opera, which is a, a very important uh, public in Bilbao, could see that we were collaborating and we and could see this picture and maybe came uh, to, to visit it live. But also, not only this participation, as well, support. You can see this painting by Luis Paret, View of Bermeo, that was acquired in 2018 with the sponsorship of BBK and the contribution of the Friends of the Museum. Remember that public subscription, I've been talking in the beginning of this talk. So it's a new, uh, it's an old formula update to our nowadays needs. And now please pay attention just for a while to the paintings itself. The painting represents a view of Bermeo, which is a fishing village in the coast of uh, Biscaya, of our province. So with this idea, it helps uh, us to program a networking that I have called Paret Returns to Bermeo, because we took the painting to the small uh, museum in the village, and we uh, let the people there enjoying this all view of their village. And in the port, we made this display to suggest the point in which Pared has took the view when the painting was painted. It's a very uh, beautiful initiative, I think. But sometimes, you know, uh, we can make things like this, use the urban space. In 2011, we had an exhibition on the important Spanish uh, painter and sculptor Antonio López, and we decided to put one of his wonderful sculptures in the middle of the city. This is the center of Bilbao. So everyone passing by got uh, really surprised with this sculpture and could read here that uh, it belonged to the exhibition celebrating at the time of, in the museum. Of course, could see that BBK, our uh, tr honor trustee, was the sponsor of the exhibition. And this is the general headquarters for BBK. So I think this was perfect for everyone. And this is the urban space, but what about the sub-urban space? We had another exhibition on hyperrealistic sculpture. You can see here the Baseski sculpture installed in the museum. And we decided, we decided to make this beautiful display on the Metro of Bilbao because Metro is also one of our trustees. So another beautiful and easy collaboration to show the collaboration and to show the museum outside uh, the museum itself. So having all these things in mind, let's have a look to what has happened in the last 10 years. In a decade, visitors coming for more than 200 to more than 300. So something is happening here. Something is happening in Bilbao. We are receiving day by day more visitors. So you can see here a picture of people queen, maybe for someone the uh, image of success. For us it's an image to worry about because it's people we are not welcoming very well. So we had to do something about this and we start a, a, a thinking 
process that I will be telling you in a minute. Most of all, new publics, another concern for museums nowadays, the digital environment. In 2018, we had nearly 400 visitors to our web. So the virtual visitors are even bigger than the physical visitors. It's something that we have to attend and it's an audience that we have to know. And what about the social media users? 100,000 last year. Another very, very important audience for us and increasingly important, I would say. Um, I can't um, stop very much on this, but I give you just three tips that I think really important for us in this issue. Sorry, speak on behalf of the institution. Generate cultural traffic. And third, connect with the audience. If we are trying to know and to connect with the audience, we do this straight on with our social media profiles. I put here a capture of, you know, this is the Instagram, I think it's last week, asking, share your opinion with us. And people really sharing their opinion with us, saying that they have loved this new installation of the collection, for instance. So this is really a direct way of knowing what they know about us. And the uh, environment keeps on changing. In 2002, Artium in Vitoria. In 2010, Azcuna Centro. I think you're going to visit or you have already visited. In 2015, Tabacalera. And in 2017, Centro Botín in San Sebastián. So there is a completely new ecosystem of cultural and uh, museums around us. So, so far we, we, we've been seeing things that are appealing us to do something. Our answer is the new strategic plan for 2018 till 2022. We're going to see now some uh, important issues of this plan and the first steps that we are making towards it. But the first, sorry, the first thing was to establish the strategic aim and the strategic movements. In the strategic aims, one, define the stakeholders and define the areas of activity. You will recognize that I've been talking about this before. Stakeholders, visitors, friends of the museum, trustees, institutions, and team. Areas of activity, collection, exhibitions, conservation and investigation, education and diffusion, and the online museum. I have been talking you know, briefly about all these questions. And the strategic movements. First, the organization. And here, please note a very important hour, a very important area, I want to say, is this new audiences area that will be created in the team in the next months. And of course, the project to enlarge the museum the project called Agravitas, by the genius Norman Foster, together with Luis Maria Uriarte, that we will see also later on. But I have told you we are making the first steps towards this important change. And the first is been museography, because we want to show in inspiring and innovative ways our collections. So you have here... To 18, the remodeling of the museum's old building. In the upper image, you see the museum as it used to be. And in the down images, you see the museum as it is today. We wanted a more neutral architectural to show the collection in a much more updated way, to make the collection talk directly with any interference of the architecture. And 
This was together with a new narration for the collection. Usually you can find the collection's order in schools, chronology, artists, periods, styles. But now we have decided in this uh, moment to show the collection following an alphabet. Instead of room one, we have room A and following the whole alphabet. Each room is a letter. Its letter, it's a word, and its word is a concept to put together different sculptures, prints, and paintings of different periods and authors. So it's a new way of seeing, a new way of trying to clean the eyes of the visitors and show the collection in completely different relationships. We have been helped by the writer, Kirmen Uribe, a very important uh, writer, to find this concept and together with the uh, museum's team find the uh, paintings that go together with the concept. Let's see some examples. This is room C, Ciudadano in Spanish, citizen, in which we can see together like a friend's meeting of different times periods, materials and styles of sculptures. And when you see it, you are part of it because, you know, it is like this high more or less and you get involved with this proposal. Or remember, I have told you to keep this uh, Baroque painting in mind, this Baroque painting that represents the emptiness the St. Peter feel when he has denied three times Christ. And this emptiness has its echo in the emptiness of this contemporary sculpture by the Basque sculptor Jorge Oteiza. And this is the only two pieces in this room H with the word Uts in Basque, that means emptiness. Or this room double L, lluvia in Spanish, rain in English, in which these beautiful drawings by a Basque drawer that had this woman having an umbrella as a symbol of his work are dropping like raindrops in the, in the room. Or remember the first pictures that I have put for the ancient museum with this uh, displaying of portraits in the room retrato in Spanish, portrait in English, using this uh, displaying of portraits of all times, uh, datings and styles as we have seen in the ancient museography. And what's that the people, what's that the audience think about this? Some of them love them and some of them don't love them at all. And we know it because we keep this, you know, primitive system, but works. It's, you know, something that we have in the desk of, you know, in the uh, entrance hall and anyone can write what he, he thinks or what she thinks about anything. We need more benches, we need more audio guys, we think the entrance is expensive and the thing is that we read them all and we answer personally them all and we make a copy to the people in the organization that may be concerned with the issue written in these labels. So small comments, sensitive to organization. It's a primitive system, but works, I'm, you know, I'm sure. And uh, together with exhibition, we've been talking about common objects with trustees. With this ABC exhibition, we made with uh, Radio Bilbao, another of our trustees, a radio story competition. The museum alphabet inspired the stories that listeners sent into being narrated and aired weekly. That was a very beautiful collaboration. But also the newspaper, Deja, another one, another of our trustees, trustees made a countdown on occasion of another that we another exhibition that we made to celebrate the 110 years they published in a countdown every day 
a visitor's selection of the most favorite work, commenting that work. There were visitors, also the team of our museum, and also politicians and artists, uh, whenever uh, many, you know, different people in the society. Talking about this museography, new ways of showing, which is a new way to say our audience to come to the museum again because we are doing new things. New exhibition formats at this, uh, like this program, a pioneer program that we, we made in 2001, is called the Guest Work. It's an exhibition of just one work of art. Usually it goes together with a, an expert lecture. And this is the new one that we are having next week. And we will have fashion in the museums. In this case, it's the Japanese Comme des Garçons uh, fashion firm, very important, that will be in this room, which is the room multicolor. So this beautiful contemporary custom will be the invited work for this, uh, for this room. In this new ways of seeing, a recent exhibition devoted to the paintings and films of the years 20 of last century that two painters, the brothers Zubia Urre, made uh, as amateurs. And we have decided to show them in this uh, big screen in a different way, with using the, the wall as a very big screen and using iPads as, you know, a photo album so people could pass, like, you know, a traditional album to see the old pictures. And also putting music, music to a silent movie. And this concept made me think about some things that we are doing in the past years and thinking about the concept, I arrived to this, that I don't know if you would agree after my explanation, what I call emotional museography. The exhibition that we have just seen before travel to the small town in which these two painters used to pass the summer it's called Garay. It's a very small village. I think there is not even a hundred of inhabitants. And we send them this small part of the exhibition that you can see in an old church that is not used anymore as a church. And using, using as well new technology, we put this you know, digital table to show the pictures. Or other initiatives like this one in 2041. 1941 sorry, 1914, was the um, fourth centennial of El Greco. There were many exhibitions in Spain, important exhibitions to celebrate this ephemeride. And we realized that the first temporary exhibition that we had in our museum, in that ancient museum, was devoted to El Greco. We had an old picture of that, and we decided to make this huge wallpaper with the old picture and study our two Grecos in a much modern way with a digital and with x-ray uh, things. So it's a way of remembering our past and being proud of our past of this, you know, humble exhibition on El Greco that was the first exhibition of the museum. But we make things like that today. You remember the exhibition I have uh, told you uh, in 1919, so important. And now room A in, we are in, an, in an alphabet, which is room art, is devoted to uh, show all the paintings that were bought in that exhibition. So you can see here the America set, and also you can see here the Gauguin that we have seen before. And now remember the three Goyas that went to France during the Spanish Civil War. The three Goyas are now on show in our museum. We have been successful to get them back to Bilbao to restore, to study it 
and to uh, show it to the public, which is very emotional. But also we have decided to expose the original crate in which they uh, went to France, the original crate with the original labels of the Basque government, which is really emotional experience from the people of Bilbao that have come to visit the, the Three Goyas. So this is what I have called the emotional museography, is trying to add an emotion, a, a, a more emotion, to the experience of seeing, which I think is important. And then the artists, we have been talking about them through all this talk. So we made a different, an exhibition putting together all the contemporary Basque artists working nowadays. It was called After 68. But also we have meeting with artists. We have here Ben Johnson uh, talking to the friends of the museum in 2014, or Jesus Mari Lazcano in 2018, also meeting with the friends of the museum. But also working with artists. We have here a meeting with Ana Isabel Roman and Edu López that have been the ones who have displayed, who have done the display of this alphabet uh, exhibition that we have right now. We made this series of talks Talk the share letter, a secret ABC in which they explained the different reasons and the different options that they decide to uh, put the, the paintings and sculptures in the order in which they are. And of course, the women artists. Here we have last year celebrating of the most important recognitions of the Basque country for the artist. In this case, were two women artists or as well celebrating gender lectures or films by feminist filmmakers like Janik Bellon. This was a lecture of Angeles Caso, who has written some books recovering uh, women uh, painters. Or this new EMAC program, a program for acquisitions to bring visibility to the works of female artists. This is one of the acquisitions by the painter Isabel Baquedano that we are having an exhibition devoted to her right now in our museum. Or small gestures like this made by my colleagues last week to... Um, to, to put this, you know, um, symbol of feminism last week. But also searching for publics, not only public coming to the museum, but the museum going out searching for publics. We made this project called Art Route in 2018, and it's a display of some of our masterpieces. You can... Recognize here, for instance, the first that we have seen, our Rape of Europe. And we made this display when, with some um, masterpieces of the collection and was touring. First, it was shown in the center of Bilbao for some weeks. And then it was touring in different villages in Vizcaya, also with an educator explaining the collection and explaining the paintings and ending in... Bilbao Airport. It was for some months in a in a period of you know vacation with when many of the tourists uh, visit Bilbao. And why? Because there is a new social change, which is the tourism in Bilbao. Something really new that. Uh, began with the Guggenheim Museum and that has been increasingly in the last years. Our museum is slowly increasingly, but now we have 60% people from Skadi and about 40% out of Skadi. I must say that just 10 years ago, this figure was uh, like um, 80% Euskadi and 20% out of Euskadi. So the figures are changing year by year. And if you see out of Euskadi, um, 14 are nationals and 23 foreigners. So we receive 
even more foreigners than people from Spain. This makes us think of some challenges for a near future, because I have been talking about what we have done, what we have been doing, but now I want to reflect of, uh, about what we have to do in the near future. So some challenges. Undertake a museum renovation for the presentation of the permanent collection, which provides available tours and reading keys and knowledge resources for our visitors. Expand and improve the reception services, taking into account that the management of new audiences, among others, those derived from the international tourism boom, is a growing challenge the museum has to face. Know the audience, analyze and evaluation, measure failure and success. This is a very important point that we have to um, begin soon. We have this, you know, system, the primitive system I have. So, of course, with the summer course, we made surveys or with, you know, different courses and activities, we made surveys. But I think we have to make this in a much more systematical way to be part important of our job. And for this, it's very important, the second challenge to involve the entire organization and it's important to measure not only failure but as well the success this is very important for the whole organization another one assume the challenges of the digital age giving greater dimension to our communication through new channels and formats this can also contribute to rejuvenation of the public segments as you see, this is a resume of many things that I've many tips that I've been giving through this talk. And two more. Turn the museum into a training center on our own issues, expanding the traditional studies on the history of art to other contemporary disciplines, from museology to techniques of video creation. At this point, a closer relationship with the artist community can be key. And to end, give the museum a greater projection in a global environment through participation and international process, projects, sorry, but also in the local area collaborating in a network with other institutions of the city and the territory. This global perspective in management, which addresses both the global context and its prominence at the local level, is part of a broader debate on the role that the museum should play in a globalized world. So things that we have been you know, going through this talk, and there is one first answer to this thing, as I have told you before. This is a gravitas, a wonderful project by the genius Norman Foster and Luis Mari Uriarte, the local architect who made the extension in 2001, who is a very well knower of our museum. A project that will give uh, the answers to many of the things that we have been talking about during this talk. With an extension of 8,000 meters, a budget of 22 uh, million euros, and a timing of 45 months. By now, uh, we hope to have the whole project done by this summer, so we can start constructor constructed by autumn, we guess. And these are the renders of the project, the original uh, renders, in which you see that the visitor's welcome is a very important part of the whole project. As I have shown you before, this queue outside the museum doesn't talk very well about our job. So we need another space and another attitude to receive and to welcome visitors. You see another beautiful render here. 
And I want to finish with these uh, beautiful images of uh, Sir Norman Foster. It's an image I cut from his Instagram, in which is uh, you see drawing the museum facade. It's a very uh, exciting picture for us. You see the heart, the likes, uh, so many likes in, in his Instagram. But you see also not this heart in the likes, but you also here you see a small heart because he wants us to note that the heart of the project is seen between the two old buildings of the museum. So I think it's a way of saying that we are looking to the past to enlarge our future. And I think this is a very good starting point for our museum. Thank you very much.